You're listening to Design Between the Lines, the only design and home furnishings podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry. It's here that I get a chance to sit and chat with the influencers shaping the industry into what it is today, and to learn a little bit more about life in their world. Taking cues from the fashion runway, Corey Damon Jenkins' work is marked by his use of vibrant color, layered patterns, and strong architectural bones. His young career reached new heights in 2011 after television audiences voted him the winning design star on HGTV's Showhouse Showdown. And since then, he's been featured in Traditional Home, The Wall Street Journal, House Beautiful, Domino, The New York Post, Architectural Digest, The Detroit News, and more. His biggest childhood dream came true in 2016 when Corey launched his first couture furniture collection, Corey Damon Jenkins, exclusively for Leathercraft. The collection was recently nominated for the prestigious 2017 Arts Award for Best Product Design. Corey, welcome. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. We're really excited. And it's like a bundle of energy just entered the room. So <laughs> well, really you. pleased that you're here. Well, I just had some Red Bull, so. Well, there you go. Gird your loins, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like, to, I'd like to start, as I do a lot of these um, uh, conversations, a little bit about Corey Damon Jenkins as he was growing up mm-hmm. and what kind of turned you towards this direction uh, where you where you arrived in your life right now i mean sure. were you interested in in design right off the bat as you were a young boy and yeah i think so you know um i was raised in a household where we were um given a lot of exposure to interior design and decoration my parents would remodel the house and redecorate frequently and so that was always something that was fun to see and i think at a very young age i took a keen interest in what my parents were going to do with the design uh so swatches of wallpaper fabric furniture my mom would lay all these things out and i always was looking over her shoulder and i had an opinion about those things Uh, i think my dad wanted me to focus more on uh, the more manly, you know, things that oh, are all yeah. about, you know, the fixing of the cars and the sports and, you know, basketball and banking and business. And get um, me a sledgehammer. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Construction, you know, or whatever. But, you know, I, and I enjoy looking at those things in, 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 in those the games, mm-hmm. basketball. But I was always looking at the basketball court ah. and the geometry and the lines on mm-hmm. the court. I was mesmerized by the stadium we were in and how was the stadium constructed. Mm-hmm. So as a child, I was always looking at beyond what the what the obvious situation was at the time and how it tied back into architecture, color and design. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. One of your influences was your was your mom, was your dad as well. Were yeah. there any other influences in your life as you as you grew up outside of the family that that might have affected the directions you take took in your thinking? Well, you know, I I think that I always was interested in design from a architectural standpoint. So, mm-hmm. I mean, just looking at the neighborhoods we were growing up in, the homes, the construction, those things really inspired me. Um, my mother um, is, is and was a beautiful woman, and uh, she knew how to you know, really work beautiful shades of makeup. And I was mesmerized by her makeup kits, the various shades of color that mm-hmm. were in those kits, that there were hot colors and cool colors. And it wasn't just restricted to the box of crayons that we were you know growing up with in school just eight colors there was eight colors and then a thousand shades of each color so things like that mesmerized me Mm -hmm. um i remember watching linda carter as wonder woman on television and her costume had all these different fabrics and textures and colors with the sequins and all that stuff and seeing how they could mix and match different colors and patterns on one body uh so i learned very early that you could really mix and match these different elements and textures and and styles and create something very cohesive and something very interesting and something that was um, uh, fascinating to people to watch. And that really influenced my vision for interior design. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Now, as you were going through school and later years, were you given some opportunities there to, to, to build your, uh, your art, your skills and and that? Well, I mean, my dad really wants me to focus more on business. He really believed that, 
design and decoration was, you know, eh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, he didn't, he, and, and to his credit, you know, him being a banker, he did not want to have a starving artist for a, a son and mm -hmm. I'm the oldest in my family and everyone is in banking everyone's in some form really? of money oh or finance you know mm -hmm. treasures and whatnot mm -hmm. and so I think that there was definitely a concern to you know bring me back from the the, the, the edge <laughs> but I knew that in my heart that's what I really need to be doing and I, I was excelling at it in school. I enjoyed drawing and sketching and, and doing 3D renderings. I was designing um, fantastical, futuristic spaceships and, and fortresses in space and designing colonies around the moon. I mean, I was always out there, but not just designing it in my head. I had the ability to actually articulate it on paper to scale. And so my mother realized he really should be doing this. Yeah. But my father was like, okay, but can he make money at it? Can he commercialize that into an actual career? Yeah. Because, you know, how how can you really take that to a career and, and, and actually take care of yourself? Yeah. So there was a definitely a little bit of a struggle there. But Good question from it, his it all, point of view. It all worked out. Very <laughs> good. Well, you came along and you got involved in this HGTV experience. Yes. How did that come about? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I had just launched my firm in 2009 mm -hmm. um, and um, at the end of the year, actually, going into 2010. Mm -hmm. And I was dealing with a very difficult economy. We were working out, working our, ourselves out of the recession. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we had the um, auto bailout mm -hmm. that President Obama authorized. And so being in Michigan and Detroit, metro Detroit area, obviously everyone was directly affected by what was happening with the automakers. Oh, yeah. So the idea of um, doing interior design and launching a firm at that point was a bit unorthodox um, at the time. But I did it anyways. I went from door to door mm -hmm. uh, with color boards and concepts to get business. And so um, when a client finally gave me a chance and let me do their home, mm -hmm. I quickly um, got it photographed. And I had put a website up, you know, CoreyDamonChickens.com from the very outset. I always understood from my father the, the importance of marketing in the business side. So even as a creative, I always got that 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 principle down. Um, but for several months, all I had on that website was just revolving sketches of rooms I had drawn. And so when I got the money together to have the rooms professionally photographed, I put those pictures up on the website. And about two weeks later, HGTV contacted me Whoa. about doing a show. And they were filming in, in Michigan. We had a Democratic governor at the time, mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer Granholm, and she was giving breaks to um, any production companies that were filming movies or television series on Michigan soil for you know a tax break. Oh, great. So Scripps was trying to film as many shows and, and series as possible in Michigan, and HGTV is you know, a division of Scripps. And so... Um, they reached out to me mm -hmm. and they were like, hey, we saw your website, we love it. Can you please give us a call back? And I had some self-esteem issues that I was dealing with at the time, mm -hmm. um, just struggling with thinking that I was not good enough, really. Mm -hmm. um, having been unemployed previously to launching my firm and that economy meltdown, mm -hmm. um, I was struggling with that. I didn't think I was worthy. So I didn't call them back for about a week. Mm -hmm. And then they called again. Well, there you go. Then yeah. they were interested. For yeah, sure. I mean, I completely blew him off. And Drew was like, uh, my executive producer, he was like, yeah, I called you about doing a television <laughs> show and it would behoove you to call me back. Yeah, uh, This is really important. This could be a really great thing for your career. And so I called him back, John. I was like, yeah, this is Corey Damon Jenkins. Sure, yeah, you want me to do a television series? Right, me, little me out of Detroit. Of course, okay, I, I'll audition, you know. And I auditioned and... Then things kind of took off from there. So I hear. Yeah. So I hear. You did very, very well. Yeah. So what? Was, tell me when you when you got up to the end there. Yeah. And suddenly, you're the star. You're the uh, winner. Um, how did that feel? And what happened after that? I, I'm sure things happened pretty quickly. Yeah. That. I kind of got you know caught with my pants down, and you know, figuratively speaking, because um, you know people always say if you go on Oprah. Oh. Yeah. To talk about your cookies that you bake in your shop, you better be ready to produce <laughs> oh, massive yeah. amounts of cookies, like copious <laughs> amounts of cookies, yeah. after you appear on her show because of the exposure. Yeah. And so I think that that platform on on Home and Garden Television was was huge. Yeah. You know, it's a prime time show, and we were back to back with Design Star, and we were airing on the weekends. And so um, there's a lot of exposure. You have all these yeah. people looking at you. So um, 
it was a big deal. But mm. I'll, I'll tell you this, I, I did not believe I had actually won. Even though I knew confidentially from the executive producers that I had won the show, uh, we did film two different endings because we didn't want the audiences that were watching the televised version uh -huh. to know and to go home knowing who the real winner was. Uh -huh. So we announced two different winners Whoa. for the, for the, for the, um, the uh, audiences. Okay. And up until the airing of the series on, on TV, mm -hmm. I still thought there's a chance I might not win. Even uh -huh. though they told me you were the real winner, I still was like, oh, this is not going to happen. It, it just seemed to be too good to be true, too wonderful, too mm. great. I'm not deserving, you know? Why would this happen to me? And so when they finally announced it, I, I burst into tears. Oh, I wow. literally bought like a little boy. I mean, just completely meltdown. Not like, that was like, that. <laughs> you know, but it was definitely a very emotional situation because it had validated a few years of toiling and mm. struggle and sleepless nights and going from door to door looking for jobs and, Balancing unemployment checks and you know checking with the government to get you know the un you know it was just so much weighing on my shoulders yeah. at that time just and to move ahead and just framed to get ahead. all in not the best economy yes there ever was the worst time to launch a business well it, when the show aired phones started ringing wow. and it has been light speed ever since wow. so you learn a lot and um, it's been a great ride. <laughs> Well, I, I want to take a moment to to pursue a little bit about what makes Corey Damon Jenkins tick. Oh boy. But let me let me kind of adjust my question a bit and just say um, ask you to talk a little bit about how you came around to defining your style. And, and in that, maybe a little bit about your creative process. Sure, absolutely. Well, I was living in New York City as a uh, teenager mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. And so I worked for a nonprofit organization and uh, worked with uh, refurbishing uh, re Renaissance uh, era hotels wow. in, in Brooklyn. And so it gave me an opportunity to see traditional design the way it's really done. Um, classic, yeah. beautiful bones, these um, historic buildings. And you saw some wonderful yes, buildings. Yes. Yeah, I got a chance to really cut my teeth on the best of what architects of the past could produce when budgets and money was a bit different. We don't quite <laughs> make them quite like that today. Yeah. So I was always a traditionalist mm -hmm. and a bit of a maximalist when it comes to being a traditionalist. I really appreciated um, good bones in a space. But I think what differentiates me from others in my field is I try to take that traditional design aesthetic and layer on top of it something that's very fashion forward, uh, something that's very sexy, mm -hmm. uh, something that's very um, timeless. It's really important that design is not dead on arrival. Sometimes when you're being too trendy with color palettes that are of the now, mm -hmm. your design is not really last very long. And so I try to produce concepts that are fashion forward, that are a bit ahead of their time. And that way I don't have to stamp a expiration day on the toe, uh, if you will, of, yes. of the project. I want to keep it fresh. And I don't want you to know what year I did it. Mm -hmm. Was it 1995? Was it 2025? What year was it done? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where taking good traditional bones, you know, traditional architecture, but then having maybe... A clean line furniture, you know, or amazing contemporary art, um, maybe painting those fluted columns and those Corinthian capitals a bright, vibrant acid green mm -hmm. or a, a, a pistachio color, you know, something that's off the beaten path that people are like, what in the world? Like, why would he do that? And <laughs> But it makes you stop. It makes you look at it and you, you get to appreciate, you know, it's still classic, mm -hmm. but it's so much more hip and fresh. Yeah. And it makes it appealing to young people and it gives older ones a chance to say, you know what, I love that when I was young. And I love it again now. That's been kind of reinterpreted for the 21st century. And the bones hold up well. Yeah. that's yeah. I mean, from Romans and Greeks till now, Egyptians, we have gleaned the best of the cultures that predated us throughout mm -hmm. the century. So all we're really doing is basically recycling it and, and, and trying to layer our own 
new nuances mm-hmm. with it. So this is my opportunity while I'm here on earth to take that to the next level in, in my way. And then someone else will come after me and they're gonna take what I've done to the next level or mm-hmm. what our generation of designers did yeah. to the different level. So it's, it's, it's cyclical. This is my cycle right now. What would you say to date is your your, your biggest success or you feel like you, this is your, 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 your greatest move in a forward direction that you've taken recently? You know, I, I am extremely blessed. Um, I do not take for granted the things that I've been given. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am well aware that um, from being my age, I've been given some access and exposure to some incredible opportunities. So I'm always mindful of that. Um, I would say HGTV. That's opened the door for other opportunities across the country as far as work. And then Leathercraft, my furniture collection. Those, there's, there's, it's, been, it's been like a chain reaction. And John, I feel like, you know, they have that saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. And so I feel like I'm like right here looking at just <laughs> leaves on the trees. I'm looking at bark on the tree trunks. I can't, I'm trying to peel myself back and to see the amazing things that mm-hmm. are, are taking place around me. But there's just so much goodness out there and I'm overwhelmed I'm humbled it's just a huge honor and uh, you just mentioned uh, Corey Damon Jenkins exclusive for Leathercraft yeah so how did that come about another phone call or how did they notice you or how did you get together with Leathercraft well Leathercraft was a really fun um, collaboration and very interesting as far as its timing because um, they were looking to reinvent themselves Um, Leathercraft's been around for 58 years and the celebrated line. They were very popular in the 80s and 90s. And then um, the management there kind of got a bit uh, comfortable mm-hmm. with where they were at in the industry and weren't really growing the brand to keep up with where technology was going as far as, you know, like social media and mm-hmm. younger designers coming up. Their, their original consumer base in the 80s and 90s were getting older and they were retiring, they were moving out of the field and they didn't really work to cultivate that new generation of designers like myself that were coming up. So when that um, um, management circle moved on and Leathercraft's own owner passed away, he passed the company on to his son, mm-hmm. uh, Staley and Staley and, and David, uh, the uh, VP of marketing, mm-hmm. they had a very distinct vision for Leathercraft to kind of revitalize it mm-hmm. and bring it back to the front and center mainstream of the industry. And so Eric Bauer, um, who was their marketing um, or um, agent mm-hmm. guy uh, said, you know what, I think we should do a designer collaboration. And I had met Eric at Market um, a couple of markets prior. We were friends on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And so he said, I think we should consider doing a, a designer collaboration on furniture and we do a feature designer thing and let's talk to you know CDJ. And, and so they reached out to my agent and they were like, let's talk to you guys about doing something. And they were so open mm-hmm. to the concept. And I was, you know, I'm very, I have ice water in my veins. Very little <laughs> riles me up or gets me super excited. Mm-hmm. I just have learned, and I guess that goes back to my life experiences growing up. I, I, I'm always thinking something is too good to be true. Uh, okay. So I always am extremely reserved. My age was like, Leathercraft wants to meet with you and talk about a collection. I had the exact same reaction, John, that I had to HGTV contact me a few years earlier. Oh my, like, okay. Like, what, what do they want? Why are they calling? Like, cynical, like, not me. I don't deserve <laughs> yeah. it. I go through this thing every single time something mm. amazing happens. I'm like, well, why, why do they want to talk to me? What, <laughs> what are they seeing in me that's so, and so, we met with them and they were so enthusiastic and so warm and welcoming and they had great ideas and I started sketching some things out and they were like, we love it. And I'm like, you do? <laughs> and they're like, we really like it. And I'm like, okay, well, here's some more sketches. Here's you know? So kept yeah. drawing more things and um, we put together a 15-piece collection. And the beauty of having an American-made manufacturer was that we were able to make everything here. Oh. Versus outsourcing it, you know, and so um, no twelve thousand five hundred mile plane flight. Well, there's you know there is some collaboration obviously (laughs) involved against certain elements we can't reproduce here in the states, but the vast majority of it was done right here, and um, within six seven months we had that fifteen piece collection. So that was rolled out what market? A year ago, a year ago, yeah, a year ago, April. So it's out in retail now. Mm -hmm. Do do you do? 
Have they asked you to do any retail store visits or openings? We're working on that. Yeah, we're working on that right now. Um, in fact, we're looking to collaborate with a few of their southern um, um, sales rep or mm-hmm. sales resources right. in, in uh, Texas. Okay. Um, and we're working on something in Michigan right now as well. So we're going to start doing like a little seminar tour. It's a great idea. Yeah. Consumers, consumers. They love, love that. that. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm sure through your social media and I, your, your social media is the, uh, is the 800 pound elephant in this studio <laughs> right now. You have great connections, oh, well. but I'm sure before you get to any location, there will be a ready-made group of people waiting for you. I hope so. Oh, I, and, you know what, John? It, so. it's, it's not about me. You know, I, I, when, I, when we had the launch party with Traditional Home, we had mm-hmm. like 400-something people people come to the launch party alone. And I was like, oh, these people. And it's so, I, you get emotional just thinking about the fact that people would take time out of their busy market schedule to see you and see your work. And once you get past that moment of emotion, then you're like, oh my God, I hope they like it. <laughs> you well, know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. I hope they buy it. Yeah. I hope that they, because then it's about Leathercraft and their significant financial investment in your vision, in your mm-hmm. dream. Yeah. That's something to take the dreams of a little boy from Metro Detroit and to take those sketches and make them into a reality. That does not happen every day. So then you really hope that you're doing a good job for them because they've put their money, their brand on the line for you. That's that's significant. That, that so is significant. if it and comes for the parties and for the speaking oh, engagements, yeah. you know, that's I'm hoping it's for for them to dignify their investment. Leathercraft um, is a celebrated line, but they have a built-in base of consumers already. Yeah. And yeah. it's an older base. Yeah. And so the whole idea was how do you keep that older base of, con- of customers interested and then also beckon a new generation of buyers. Mm. And so uh, I had a bit of a learning curve. They can make anything, but will it sell? Yeah. You know, is it something that will, ap- that will appeal to the masses? And um, so I had to learn to be humble to recognize that you have to check your ego at the door. It's not about you. It's about sales and making it palatable for, for your, your, um, your brand that you're representing. And so, uh, fortunately they were so accommodating. It's a family based company and they were all about core, whatever you need. Mm. But then you learn, it's not really about what I need. It's about what do you want? Yeah. And once you get that happy medium between what the designer is looking to express himself with and what the company's sales pitch needs to be. Yeah. Somewhere therein is where a happy medium can be found. And that's when things take off. And that's when numbers start to come in and people are happy with the royalty checks, they're happy with the sales <laughs> yeah. at the different showrooms and everyone is pleased with the collaboration. So. Well, well said, well said, well said. Corey, a, a few minutes ago we talked a little bit about role models and mentors and uh, off off the air, and I thought I need to bring that up because where we were headed in that last few minutes of discussion kind of lends itself to, to to you maybe speaking to folks who helped you along the way sure. that, that you uh, respect and right. uh, uh, that did mentor you. Sure. Yeah, there were, um, I've had a lot of great mentors and people that have been supportive, especially since the career kind of took off Mm -hmm. after HGTV. But um, there was a a couple of people that I thought in particular that were there for me from the very, very beginning, like really early on. Uh, There's a gentleman that works at Kravit. Uh, He's my salesperson there. His name is Michael Stewart. Stewart. And um, Michael's this really well-dressed, kind of poindexterish, you know, <laughs> guy. The dude has a degree in fashion and a degree in interior design. So Whoa. he's amazing. And um, Michael is older than me. And it's been like a dad and a big brother in many respects to me because when so many other designers and others in our industry were not really giving me a shot mm-hmm. or were it's more, you know, snobby and a little condescending to the new kid on the block, mm-hmm. um, that hurt because I just wanted to be accepted and just be part of the community. Right. He was always that one person that would take me in, you right. know, and support me when others in my industry in Michigan were like, I can't be bothered with him, you know? Um, so Michael would, Michael was like helium for me. Huh. He was like helium. I mean, I would become so deflated mm-hmm. from, the struggles of launching the firm in that difficult recession yes. and 
the whole door to door search for work and the slamming of doors of people who weren't interested. Yeah. Um, and, and just beating myself up. Like, is this a fool's dream? Am mm-hmm. I wasting my time? And Michael became like helium. He filled me up with confidence mm-hmm. and composure and a, a sense of belonging. Um, and, <clears throat> You know, helium when you when you inhale it, it makes your your voice get kind of like you know like yeah. really high pitch. Right back to eight years exactly, old. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and so, in a sense, Michael would kind of make me feel that way. He he brought back the excitement and the passion. He reminded me of, I guess, a better way to put it would be he reminded me of the passion, the excitement that made me want to get into interior design to begin to with. Begin with, yeah. you know, that childlike wonder, that mm-hmm. childlike amazement of the industry and in the in the in the the career, what mm-hmm. it meant. And so I really credit him to consistently, from the very beginning, being there for me. You know, some people, as you know, they'll, they don't want to support support when you first get started mm-hmm. and they come around like Johnny come lately's when you actually blow up and become successful. Yeah. Some people will change. They're cool with you and they're friendly when you're nobody. And then as you become more successful, they become jealous and they drop like a bad habit. Yeah. Very few people are cool with you from A to Z, all the way through the ups and the downs. And Michael was that person for me. He was not out in the magazines. He was not the parties. He was not a a well-known personage. But for me, he was the backbone and Mm -hmm. really gave me the support that I needed when when my family and others were thinking I was pursuing a a dumb dream. So um, he and I get to laugh all the way to the bank sometimes. We look at magazines and the footage, and we're like, wow, did you read this? And he's like, and he's always like, I told you this uh, would happen. He's yeah. one that makes you step back from the forest and, and look at the whole forest. I'm always like this. And he's like, no. Look at it from look the 20,000 foot level. Exactly. Yeah. And it keeps you humble, yeah. but it also gives you excitement to continue moving forward. Oh, so, so he was great. And another person I thought was really pivotal for me was uh, a very established and celebrated designer in Hollywood. His name is Ron Woodson, and he's half of the design team, Woodson and Rummerfield. And Ron is uh, another brilliant mind. I love his design aesthetic. Um, He's Mm African-American, and I only mention his culture for one reason. Mm -hmm. Um, There are not very many men of color in our industry that are of of note. You're you're right. And Mm -hmm. so... um, there was one other designer that I had reached out to, um, and I, he didn't return my call or my emails, and it's okay. Mm. And so I reached out to Ron, because there were only two guys that I could really relate to that I could see doing it and getting published and getting coverage, and, and Ron actually called me back. Huh? That's good. And I was like, wow, and we talked for like two hours. Wow. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm talking to this major celebrity personage in this industry. He does not know me from Adam. And he's given me all this great advice. And it helped me to see that in an industry that was mostly dominated by women mm-hmm. and you know other men who are not minorities, um, he helped me to see that you can do this. You can break through that boundary um, and, and make a career out of this, even though others around you are telling you it's, it's stupid. So you know, my father, I think he saw, I think he looked at it from the the framework of how he grew up mm-hmm. in yeah. the 50s and 60s right. and just couldn't see me making it in this field from his standpoint. From yeah. Whereas his contemporary, Ron mm. Woodson, had made it, uh. had broken down doors when things were difficult during that time period. Mm. It was telling me you can succeed. So I had two opposing viewpoints. And both were valuable. One taught me business to remain grounded with the financials and you know, run your business carefully. Right. And the other one, run for your dreams. Don't run from them, run for them. For them. And then Michael in the middle is telling me, you, know, you can do all of it. Just remember to take a step back and, re- and, and rejoice in your success. So I actually credit all three men, my father, Michael, and Ron. Each produced a very differing opinion, mm-hmm. but they all coalesced into what I am today. What's the latest thing happening for Corey Damon Jenkins? What's the next great uh, thing? There's a lot going on. You know, we we want to continue developing uh, product lines. So mm-hmm. I want to get into fabric design and rug design and 
lighting design. Uh, I have some really exciting ideas I want to partner with some manufacturers on and bring those dreams to a reality. So we're working on that. Um, the traditional home spread uh, that we had a year ago brought mm -hmm. us a lot of exposure and a tremendous amount of business. So any designer that tells you, you know, I've been published and I never got anything from it, I cannot vouch for that experience. I think we've gotten about seven projects from that one spread. Wow. And I'm not talking great. about little rinky dinky mm -hmm. projects or, or even single room jobs. I'm talking like eight, 10, 12,000 square foot homes. And not just in Michigan, we're now expanding to Connecticut and New York City. So what's next for us right now is I'm working on a fascinating project with a couple in New Canaan, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, they saw me in the magazine. Yeah. Um, both homes had a American colonial revival architectural theme. Mm -hmm. So the woman in Connecticut could see what could be done with her home by seeing how I interpret the same style of architecture and, and my other clients home in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So they hired me and brought me out to do their house. And now that's now spread to another project. Uh, a couple in London saw the article online. Wow. And they are now working to bring me in to help them with their home in Connecticut. So, um, it's been exciting. So now the, 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 the challenge is, okay, I'm in New York half of my month. Yeah. And I have my wonderful clients in Michigan. So we are actually officially opening up a studio, a satellite office in New York City. Congratulations. That's the goal for this year. And right. I'll keep my studio in Michigan as the main headquarters. Right. So all the business and billing and mm -hmm. CAD work and arch, you know, architectural design and color boards and my main staff will all remain in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Uh, technology enables us to, you know, correspond. Um, we're only f 58 minutes across the water yeah. from New York. Yeah. Uh, so I'll have an assistant or two in New York City and we'll be able to now stay, you know, there and work 10, 12 days out of the month and be on on site and be more visible for our clients there. And so, yeah. It's... Can you tell me a little bit about, the, give give something to our, our listeners uh, who may be considering a career, uh, whether it be in interior design or maybe even in product development, such mm -hmm. as in design, such as you're doing with Leathercraft, uh, something you can maybe give them in, in terms of um, advice. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of students will ask me when I teach at different um, universities or seminars you know, across the country, they'll say, what should I, what's the biggest tool that I should have in my arsenal to become a great designer? What should I learn in school? What curriculum should I follow? Um, what school should I go to, blah, blah, blah. And I always tell them, schooling and all that's great, but it's a certain quality that you must cultivate if you're going to make it in this industry. And they'll say, well, what is that? Is it a great eye for color, a great eye for texture? So those, those are all skills. Those are not qualities. The quality you need the most to really make it in this industry is humility. You must have humility. If you do not have humility, you will fail. Wow. Utterly. And we take the Greek, the, the word humility is based on the Greek word humus, which when translated to English means dirt-like. So we have to keep our heads close to the ground. When you keep yourself close to the ground, if you happen to stumble, you don't have very far to fall. But the higher you put yourself up in the sky, the greater gravity will pull you down. Mm. And the bigger the splat you make when you land. Yeah. So when you're dealing with clients, you have to be humble. It's not your money. It's not your house. It's their house. It's their money. Yes, you bring the vision. Yes, you bring the style. But at some point, they will bend as clients to your will. And there are points where you will have to bend to theirs because it is their house. And the moment that you show a crack in your armor and get an attitude about it, you may lose that job. If you're collaborating with a company like Leathercraft or any other manufacturer, it is their money. It is their product. It is their consumer base. Yes, you are the feature designer. Yay! Celebrity, <laughs> wonderful. Right. But if your stuff does not sell, or if there is some sort of problem with working with you as a collaboration, mm -hmm. the word in the industry will be negative, and no one will want to work with you. Yeah. So you can't be a diva. You can't come in there with your collar all popped up, and you're acting <laughs> like you're just a celebrity. We are post-recession. The days of designers walking around with arrogance and, and haughtiness and thinking they're just this, you know, whatever. The, the industry has shifted. Yeah. 
are these millionaires and billionaires, they've changed. Mm -hmm. They don't want to necessarily show off the best of their money because they have people who are, they have friends and family who are still picking themselves up off the ground financially. And this is 10 years later. Yeah. So right. when a designer walks in the door, John, they have this arrogant attitude. It's disgusting to them. Mm -hmm. Because if anyone has the right to be that way, it would be them. Yeah. Let right. them be that way. But yeah. we as service providers cannot afford to do that. I'm hoping that these young people will, will take the best of what we've produced and take it to the next level. And, and just remember to keep your eyes level. You know, don't look at the sun, you'll blind yourself. Don't look on the ground because you'll trip and fall. Just stay focused ahead and, and remember those who helped you get there. Well, on that note, I cannot <laughs> add anything to that. Corey, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having it's me. It's a pleasure to meet you and get um, to know you a little. Honors all mine. Thank you so much. Have a great market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to thank Corey Damon Jenkins for joining me to discuss the growing pains of starting a business, the mindset required to design a licensed collection for today's consumers, and the role respect plays in building and sustaining positive relationships. Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the American Society of Furniture Designers. We're recorded in High Point, North Carolina. To learn more about ASFD, visit asfd.com. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of Design Between the Lines.